Good morning. Welcome to You Flourish Church. Uh, my name is Kurt. Uh, I serve as one of the pastors here at You Flourish Church. Hey, we are excited that you came by to worship with us uh, uh, this morning. Uh, you could have went anywhere and you decided to be with us. And for that, which we're truly, truly uh, thankful. Uh, you know, one of the uh, most interesting films I ever watched was a film released in uh, 1998 starring Jim Carrey called The, the Truman Show. And, and in this movie, he believes he's an ordinary man, but unbeknownst to him, his life has always been a reality TV series. Uh, he, he's essentially, he's born on this reality TV uh, series, and his parents, his girlfriend, his job, everybody in his life is an actor. His whole life takes place on this humongous TV set, and, and, and for his entirety of his life, he has no idea that everything and everybody in his life is an actor. Subsequently, the Truman Show provides a compelling illustration of how false teaching perpetuates a false reality that dictated Truman's entire life. Similarly, a spiritual environment of false teaching can also perpetuate a false reality that can dictate the entirety of a believer's life. Uh, Paul's message in Galatians is to ensure that their faith would not be rooted in a false reality, but rather in the true message of Christ Jesus. And as we continue in our series today, we pick back up in Galatians 5, and the p two points of emphasis in Paul's message is, is Paul, he confronts their hindrance to obedience, and, and Paul, he confirms that love fulfills our debt to obey. And, and this morning, we're going to um, uh, begin by unpacking that first point as, as Paul confronts their hindrance to obedience. Again, today, we pick up in Galatians uh, 5, we'll begin in the seventh verse, but before we go there, may we go to the Lord in prayer. Um, God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for your kindness, God. There is none like you in all the earth, God. And so today we pray, God, that, that you would speak to us. And God, we pray that you will anoint our ears to apply, uh, 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 to hear everything it is that you would speak to us, God. And we pray that you will anoint our hearts to apply all that it is that you would speak unto us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And, and it reads, beginning in the seventh verse, uh, fifth chapter of Galatians, uh, he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate uh, themselves. Uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. I hear a few people laughing at that last one. We'll <laughs> I got to preach that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there, but, but here. <laughs> Paul, he confronts the church in Galatia one final time. All throughout what we find in Galatians, Paul has been confronting the church about this belief and, and this teaching that's going on that perverts uh, the freedom that we find in the gospel of Jesus. And, and, and so uh, this was such a sticking point for Paul because what was being taught, it was so counterintuitive to the gospel that he had sowed into their lives. He had put a lot of time and energy uh, sowing the truth of the gospel in their lives. And he, he was convinced that, that there's someone uh, that was among them that was persuading the church to embrace a work-based religion over relationship. 
And, 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 and Paul, he wants them to understand that this, like, this is necessarily not the case. In verse 7, Paul, he goes on to say, he like, you were running well. And he says, but who hindered you from obeying the truth? And so, so initially, Paul, he recalls how uh, they were running for Jesus as they lived out their, their, their faith and their freedom in Christ. And, and they began running really well. They, they, they began serving God really well. And so he acknowledges that. That. But he sees something different that's transpiring in their lives right now. And, and so now he's asking the question, you started out so well. Who has hindered you from obeying the truth? Paul is certain that someone among them is perverting the truth of the cross he had laid out before them. And, 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 and here, here's the thing, Paul, he, he, he laid it out of what it would take for, uh, to be able to receive salvation and how we are to, to walk in this, this, this level of freedom, how we are to walk in this, this, this whole concept of what Christ has done for us. And someone came behind him and started adding some things on. And Paul is so convinced that there's somebody within that group of Galatians that's teaching something that's counterintuitive intuitive to what the gospel stands for. Uh, uh, so much so that Paul, he has to address it. And the interesting thing about this is that it's, 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 it could be very, very clear that uh, some of the people that's reading this letter, the very person that's perverting the gospel may be one of the people that's actually reading this letter. Uh, and and, and so, so Paul, he asks, who is he that hinders you from living the life God intended for you to live. And, and, and this is a, a, a question that was not only relevant at that point in time, ladies and gentlemen, it's relevant for us even today. And so, so Paul, he asked this question. Paul, he questions what hindered the Galatians from, from living a life as God intended. And again, the, the same could be asked of us today. And, 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 you know, there's, there's always more than one way. There's a life that God intends for us, and then there's a life that somebody else intends for us. Or there's a life that we intend for ourselves. And, and we can go through life in, 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 in all of those different directions, but I always say there's no greater place than to be the place that God intended for you to be. There's no greater place, there's no greater level of success, there's no greater level of peace, there's no greater level of harmony when you're in the place that God intended for you to be. And this is, this is part of our mission here at You Flourish Church. We say our, our, our mission is to be a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, church-planning church, helping people flourish in the life not Kurt and Ronaldo intended for you to live, for the life that God intended for you to live. Because when you can get in the place that God intends for you, I'm here to tell you that everything begins to flow the way it was intended to flow. God did not create us to do our own thing. He, he, he created, I mean, we are his creation. We're the ones that he loves and that he cherishes but we were created for worship of him. And, and, and so we can create our own plans and our own ideas, but God has an intent for our lives. And there will always be somebody or something that comes in the way to get you to live a life that God did not intend for you. And so this is where Paul is at with the Galatians. He's like, hold up, who hindered you? Who hindered you? From obeying the truth, the truth was laid out. God has a desire for you. God has a plan for you. And whether it is you in your own ways or whether it's somebody else, Satan has a way of influencing a person, a thing, a situation to get you to operate in every other way except what it is that God has intended. Possibly, the Galatians had found comfort in their, in their traditions. Uh, they, they had found comfort. In, and here, here, here's the thing. Here, here's the point of contention and what we've seen in, in Galatians up to this point. The point of contention is they actually have a biblical basis that says circumcision is right. God makes a promise to Abraham 
And 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 a part of that 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 promise, what would signify that promise is that every male child would be circumcised. Uh, that that signifies this promise that God made to Abraham. And if you're talking about a a a, a, a church and a people that has a bloodline to Abraham, and it's written right there that it is an everlasting covenant. It's not like they just pull something out of the air. What, 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 what Paul is, 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 is teaching may appear to them to be something that's completely different. And that you circumcision up to this point, uh, the, again, that was signifying of what was. But what they were missing is what is. And what is, is Jesus, that promise Jesus fulfills, that promise that was made to Abraham. Jesus, he comes and he pays the price for your sins, for my sins, and for the sins of the world. He fulfills it all on the cross, and then he gets up on the third day with all glory and with all might. And now it's no longer me trying to fulfill the written laws that was given to Moses. So me trying to fulfill uh, uh, what was taught way back when, it's now that I place my faith in Jesus who already paid the price. The price is already paid. And so this point of contention, Paul had taught them now, you don't have to be good. You don't have to earn your way into the kingdom. Like Paul, he, he laid it out because of, uh, there, there was some failure of those trying to attain righteousness through their own ways by being good, by following all of the rules, by doing this and, and doing that. And, and, but, 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 but Paul, he, he helps them to understand that it's not based on anything that you do. It's not based on any of your accomplishments. Your salvation is not based because on you being good and on you cleaning yourself up and on you, you being a good person. It's not based on you giving to the poor. And while all of these things are probably good things, I just want you to understand, that's not how you got saved. And, and Paul, he wants them to understand that it had nothing to do with, with you being a good person. It had nothing to do with, with you helping people out and, and, and you're caring for other people. Paul wants them to understand that your salvation has been secured by what Jesus did, not by what you did. And I want, don't lose sight of, of the focus in the church. They began, they ran well with this idea that it was based off of what Jesus did, and now I'm able to walk into his kingdom based off of what he did and not what I did. Yes. To all of a sudden now they're saying, no, you can't really have salvation unless you really got to prove it. Uh, yeah, yeah, circumcision is, is going to be necessary. And so, so Paul is asking like, who hindered you from obeying the truth? And the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus paid the way for you to have salvation. It's not based off of you following the, the rules. It's, it's not, based off of, not, not, not based off of that. And so, so the, the question, ladies and gentlemen, that we have to ask ourselves is, what is hindering us from living, living the life that God intended for you to live? And let me just, again, I say that sometimes we have a life that we intend for us to live. Again, other people may have a life where you didn't intend to live. But at the end of the day, the only life that will flourish is the life that God intends for you to live. It's the only life that will flourish. Now, you may have all kind of dreams and things for yourself, and, you know, you know, and my kids will tell you, like, I, I just ain't into dreams. I, I, don't, I don't do dreams. I mean, and I, and I hate to knock people for the dreams that they have and this and that, but, but I understand that there's something that's greater than any dream that I could dream up for myself. I chased dreams for a long time. I chased dreams so much I got myself in trouble. I chased dreams so much I almost got myself killed. I chased dreams so much I almost ended up in prison for all of my life. Like, I, I just decided I'm no longer chasing dreams. I'm chasing what God has for my life. You know, because before I was in my mother's womb, God, he knew me. 
before you were in your mother's womb, God knew you and he had already assigned and ordained the steps that you would take in your life. Do you really think that you can wrestle with God? You really think that you could just like forget all the plans that God has for my life? I got a plan. And this is what I'm going to be. I'm going to be an entertainer. I, 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 you know, I don't know, y'all. All I know is that you, you got your plan. Say all the, all the plans of a man seems right to him. But, uh, but the Bible said, but, it, but it's, God who directs the, it's God who directs the steps. And, and, and so, 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 the, so the true thing is I, I must find myself in a place like, God, what is it that you have for me? What is it that you have for my life? God, where is it that you want me to be? And, and, and to have a posture like, God, I'll go. May not be what I intended. May not be what I like, but, I'm, I'm, but I, I think I'm going to be happy with it. I think I'm going to have some joy with it. Why? Because God's will is a perfect will. And so Paul, he talks to the, uh, the, the, the Galatians wanting to know who, who hindered you. And, and how often, I, I have to ask, do we examine ourselves with the willingness to confront what is truly hindering God's intent for our lives? What is it? And it, it, again, it could be a person, it could be a place, it could be a thing, it could be a habit. Could be, I mean, it could be a number of things that sometimes if we don't examine ourselves, we don't allow it to be confronted. Like, God, am I in the will that you have for my life? Am I in that will? And again, and if I'm not, like, am I willing to confront the thing that hinders me from walking in the intent that God has for my life? And, and surprisingly, let me just say this, that the hindrance is not always recognized as something to avoid. In fact, it can be quite persuasive. Uh, and, and so much so in verse 8, Paul proclaims, he says, the persuasion is not from him who calls you. Uh, and, and so everything that, that looks good, that feels good, and everybody else is doing it, don't mean that that persuasion is coming from God. And so we can get so caught up in that, we can get caught up in that thing because everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is saying it. And, and it looks like this is the thing that we need to be doing. But Paul is saying this persuasion does not come from God. In other words, again, don't matter who's all doing it, don't matter how good it looks, does not necessarily mean it derives from God. And, and subsequently, Paul, he calls the Galatians to be on high alert, as he says in verse 9. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, ye yeast is probably one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. Like, uh, you know, if you, you know, I've tried to make some bread before in, in my lifetime, you know, it's nothing... Nothing like some, a fresh loaf of bread uh, that, that you've made yourself. And, and it's amazing because it's nothing but, it's nothing but, a, but a little lump of, of dough. But, but once you add the yeast in, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you can sit there and you can watch it or you can walk away. You can come back and it's like poof. It's like it, it didn't work, work. It don't, the yeast doesn't work its way in a, a portion of the loaf. Like you won't find a deformed loaf where it's like high up here and a little low in the middle. Like, no, it, it works its way in the entirety of the dough, and everything, everything rises. The interesting thing, it even rises before you put it in the oven. It rises like right on the counter. It's like one of the most amazing things. And so, and, and, and so, so Paul, he, 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 he tells them to, to, to be very careful because, again, he says, a little leaven. He says, it leavens the whole lump. And essentially what he's saying is, is, is he's reflecting the false teaching. He says, you let a little bit of false teaching comes in, it's going to end up destroying the entire body. It'll, it'll destroy the entire local body if you begin to start embracing a truth that's not a truth. It changes the entire reality. False teaching perpetuates a false reality. 
I, I remember I was, I, 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 I grew up in church and, you know, I, I was taught something. I wanted salvation. I, I, I desired salvation. I, I, I wanted God. I, I, I would see people in church and it seemed like God was coming into their lives and, 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 and you could visibly see the things that was happening. And I'm like, man, I want that. Whatever that is, I want some of that. And, and, and I tried and I tried and I searched for it and I searched for it and I prayed for it. And, 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 I, and I was taught something. I was, I was taught that the spirit don't dwell in the unclean temple. That's what I was taught. And, and I heard it quite often. I heard it quite often. And let me just say this. This did not come from like evil people. Sometimes when we think about false teaching, we think it's like somebody like Dr. Evil. It's like, hey, I'm going to come in and I'm going to screw up all of the Bible. Yeah. Like, no, this is a... That, I, very rarely do we realize that sometimes false teaching can come from people with good intent. They don't have any intentions to teach you the wrong thing. They're teaching you the best that they know how. And if somebody that's been taught the wrong thing and they never learned anything any differently, they teach the next generation the wrong thing. And, 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 so, and so for years and years, what had been passed down was the spirit don't dwell in the unclean temple. And, 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 and I really believe that. I really believe that. And I believe that's why God didn't want no part of me is because I'm unclean. And until I can clean my insides up, like God, and it made sense. Why would God want to hang out in a the, in the junkyard? Like it made sense to me. Uh, but then the internet came out. And I stopped reading like the paper Bible and I, well, I was so impressed with the internet because I could type stuff in and all of a sudden everything would just come, it would come to fruition. And so I started reading the Bible on the internet and I would just type words in and scriptures. I didn't even have to remember them anymore because I could just type it in and it tell me where it was at. I was so fascinated. So, so one day I decided, let me f find that scripture that says, the spirit don't dwell in the unclean temple. And I go typing it in, and I'm like, oh, it ain't in here. Maybe I ain't saying it right. <laughs> let me change the word. And I change the word, and I'm like, eh, 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 where, 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 where'd it go? Who stole that out the scripture? And, 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 and man, it blew my mind. It was never in the scripture. It was never in the scripture to begin with. And somebody who was evil or somebody who had evil intent was not the person who gave that to me. It was people who loved me, people who cared for me, people who wanted to see me in relationship with God. They just didn't have the knowledge. They took what was told to them and they told it to others. Ladies and gentlemen, how important it is for you to know the word of God for yourself. And, and, and so what ended up happening is because a little leaven leavens the entire lump, I just accepted the fact that I'm going to hell. I just accepted the fact because unlike other people, I could not clean myself up. I, could not, I didn't understand what was wrong with me. How could everybody else seem to get it together except I thought something was wrong with me. And, and so, so Paul, he wants the Galatian church to understand, like, you've got to be very, very careful of what it is that you're hearing. And not only that, Paul, he's not just coming up and pulling something from the air. Paul is teaching the very same thing that Jesus taught. Oftentimes, we miss it with Paul and Jesus Paul is teaching about Jesus. Paul teaches what Jesus taught. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 16 and 6, look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus taught the very same thing. And here's the thing. We see Pharisees and Sadducees, and we think these were evil people. We think they were evil people because they killed. They thought they were doing the will of God. They didn't have evil intent. They were wrong in their thinking. They were wrong not recognizing the person that they were waiting for was standing before them. But they did not have evil intent. But Jesus says, beware of the leaven because why? They don't quite understand the scriptures the way the living word does. <laughs> 
They studied it. They went to school. They were the lawyers. They were the professionals. All of that. But they still miss something. They still miss the understanding of the words. How often did Jesus have to come and say, you have heard that it was said, but I say like the word had to come put some things in order. And so, so Jesus himself said, I want you to beware of the leaven of those that are teaching you false things. Again, it may not be that they have evil intent. And so if you're looking for evil people, you're going to miss it. Sometimes, again, you look at me, I'm nice. I'm nice looking. <laughs> I seem friendly and you're like, oh, yeah, I could trust him. But I'm telling you. It behooves you to check what I'm saying. To go home, be like the Berean people. Go home, check the scriptures, and to see if what I'm saying is true. And if it ain't, man, send me a text. Like, wait, hold up, Pastor Kurt. Like, ah, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so the leaven of false teaching is what hindered the church in Galatia from living the life that God intended for them. God intended for them to live a life of freedom, not a life of bondage. I got to follow the rules. Got to go to church. Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night prayer, Wednesday night Bible study, Friday night. <laughs> like, like, yeah, like all of that stuff. I mean, everybody puts their own spin on the gospel of Jesus. Everybody, and we all come from some place, whether you were born in a Pentecostal church or raised up in a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, a Baptist church, a Methodist church, everybody got their idiosyncrasies. Everybody do. And so what you've got to figure out is which idiosyncrasy is not necessary for me to have a right relationship with Jesus. Like, I want to take the filter off. I want to take the filter off of the gospel and give people an unfiltered presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when, what that means is no matter how bad you are, no matter how short you've fallen, is that Jesus still wants you, that he still wants to have a relationship with you. No matter how bad you think you are, no matter how bad your marriage is, no matter how bad bad your relationship with your children is, Jesus still wants you. Jesus still wants to get involved in that thing. He still wants to work it out. He don't want you to try to clean up your insides. Jesus like, man, just, just lay down. Lay down. You know what they say in the streets when they rob you? Like, lay down and break yourself. You, you lay down and break yourself. And, and this is what Jesus is saying. Like, lay down. Break yourself and let me get in there and I can clean you up. Any, any teaching that diminishes the work of Jesus in our lives is like the leaven that penetrates the entire lump. Subsequently, though, the false teaching existed. Paul expresses his confidence that the truth would stand. In verse 10, he goes on to say, I have confidence in the Lord that you would take no other view. He says, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. And again, I say, I think Paul knew that the person he was talking about would be reading this letter. <laughs> uh, uh, but the point is, is, let me say this, that... that there will always be a cost to perverting the gospel. There will always be, a, and, and let me just say that the preacher has a very high responsibility that he is teaching truth versus teaching his opinion, yes. what he thinks, how he feels, his traditions, and all of those different things. There's a major responsibility. There's a major responsibility. And, 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 and point is, is, let me just say, is that the truth ain't popular. And, and in most cases, it's offensive. As Paul proclaims in verse 11, Paul says, but if brother, I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. And Paul is helping them to understand. He's like, man, I no longer preach the necessity of circumcision. 
Uh, and, and, and if you want to get circumcised after receiving salvation, that's fine. But it's not a precursor to salvation. It's not needed for salvation. And when we start adding additional things on in order to be saved, there's a problem. Uh, uh, when, I, when I studied my doctorate, I, I did a part of my study was uh, um, uh, interviewing other pastors about some of their theological beliefs. And, and, and one of the gentlemen, uh, I remember him mentioning to me during the interview, he said, well, I used to be a liberal. He says, but when I gave my life to Christ, I realized that I now have to be a conservative. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really amazing. That's what, and and, and I, don't, I don't care whether you're a conservative or a liberal. None of that matters to me because none of it is mentioned in the Bible. Right? There, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that say we have to be conservative or liberal. There's just like... Like man has added that on, but it just blew me away that you believe that you have to vote a certain way in order to be Christian. Now, you probably got people on both sides of the aisle who believe that. Well, I got to vote this way in order to be Christian. Like, no, no matter whether you vote or whether you don't vote, no matter who you vote for or who you don't vote for, it has nothing to do with the salvation tied to the kingdom of God. Jesus himself says, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, guess what? Trump is of this world. Kamala is of this world. Like, I, like again, I, I'm, I don't want to get into any of that, but I'm saying uh, it just blew my mind that this gentleman believed that he had to vote a particular way in order to have salvation. And the point that I'm trying to make today, ladies and gentlemen, is salvation is free. Why did we make it so hard and so difficult? Maybe more people would want Jesus if we actually let people have Jesus. <laughs> but no, we don't want to give people Jesus. We want to give them our doctrine. We want to tell people how to dress, how to have service. I was watching Facebook the other day, and, and somebody said, why don't, the, why don't the church let God in the service anymore? And I'm thinking to myself, why don't the people in the church let God in their life Monday through Friday? <laughs> with people. You want the spirit to move in the service, but not in your life. Like, what's wrong with that? It's like, like, like y'all, y'all, I'm a good Pentecostal boy. I mean, I come from, like, I, I, I like a good fire field service, like people running around and, and I, like, I, I, I'm not against that. I ain't against that. But I'm against it when we replace that in place of having a spirit-filled life. Yes. Yes. You mean, you ugly, uh -huh. treat people bad, borrow money, don't pay it back. <laughs> but then you all around the church. Ah! <laughs> oh, the spirit moved today. You should have been at church. Oh, the spirit moved. I want him to move on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let them move on Tuesday. <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing. Paul, he, 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 he helps them to understand, like, man, I'm going through persecution. I'm going through persecution because I preach the truth. And, and Paul is, 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 is not preaching the truth for the sake of persecution, but he's willing to be persecuted for the sake of the truth. Paul is willing to bear his cross, even if the cross he bears offends those embracing a filtered gospel. Uh, Paul is so angry at the perversion of the gospel, he makes known his wishes in verse 12. And this is what y'all been waiting for. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Castration. He's like, don't just get circumcised. You want people to get circumcised so bad? Just cut it off. Like, if you, if you can make it into heaven by just getting rid of some of the foreskin, imagine your place in heaven if you just cut it off. <laughs> uh, let me get to my, my, the second point. <laughs> Paul, 
Second point is Paul confirms that love fulfills our debt to obey. Uh, picking up in verse 13, look at what it says. He says, for you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Here, Paul, he, he continues a theme he has made prevalent in his letter to the Galatians, and that is one of freedom. In, in verse 13, Paul makes it known that freedom was the thing God was calling them to, as he says in verse 13, he says, for you were called to freedom talking about the life that God intends for us to live. Look, look at what he said. He said, you were called to freedom. And he goes on and says, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul wants them to understand that the Christian life, it is a life of liberty. And Jesus himself says that he came to set the captives free. But unfortunately, we thought he was talking about somebody else. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that we were held captive by the traditions and the rules and the regulations of church doctrine. But, but Jesus said, I, I come to set the captives free. And let me just say this, that we don't receive a small piece of freedom after salvation, but freedom becomes the essence of our salvation. And he says it is a calling, and with that calling comes an opportunity. And let me just say that the biggest fear of the legalists is that the message of freedom promotes an opportunity to live any old kind of way. And I've heard, I mean, because, you know, again, growing up as a Pentecostal, I had friends that were Baptists, and I'd go outside and play. Like, what kind of church you go to? Like, Baptist? I'm like, y'all folks ain't saved. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, all this once saved, always saved mess. Y'all want to live any kind of way. Oh, no. Like, God got some standards. Y'all go, oh, you can't live any kind of way. Uh, but, but, but here's the thing. It's the, 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 Paul says, I don't want you to take your freedom and to use it for self-seeking endeavors. He says, I want you to take your freedom in Christ, and I want you to use it to serve others through love. And, and, and that solves that. So you don't have to worry about folks living any old kind of way. But, but the thing is, if I make a mistake and I fall, like the blood of the cross has covered me. I'm covered. There's that insurance. You know, there's nothing worse than not having insurance. And you always see on like Judge Judy, they get into an accident. It's like, did you have insurance? Well, I did. I just missed my payment. Like you always just, just miss your payment. But, but here's the thing. But when you, when the thing, when you are in Christ, like you're always covered, yes. always covered. And, 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 and so it's, it's not a matter of using my freedom to live any kind of way. Paul, again, he says, don't. He says, serve one another in love. And so here's the thing. It's, it's not for us to focus on, on what's self-seeking, but, but let us focus on fulfilling the needs of others. Ladies and gentlemen, This is exactly what Jesus did for us. He served our needs instead of his own. This is exactly what he did for us. I mean, he could have just stayed in the comfort of his kingdom. He he could have. I'm sure it's beautiful up there. I'm sure it's amazing up there. But he looked down and he saw his people who couldn't not seem to get themselves right. They failed time and time and time again. And the penalty for death, I mean, the penalty of sin was death. Everybody got a sentence of death. And the price would have to be paid that he would have to come off of his throne, come down into the earth to die a gruesome death to pay for the sins of you, me, and the entire world. Jesus served our need for a Savior. And and this is what Jesus meant when he said he did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it, and he did it through love. He fulfilled the law through love. Jesus gave us a prime example of what it takes to conquer the flesh. Selfless, driven love conquers the flesh. As Jesus fulfilled the entirety of the law through selfless, driven love for us, we too can follow his example. In verse 17, Paul proclaims what Jesus proclaimed. Look at what he says. He says, 
for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 22. Jesus says that love for God and love for your neighbor, he says all the law and everything that was written depends on it. Depends on it. And so Paul, he closes by giving us the alternative. Uh, he says in verse 15, he says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, many times we see a church that looks just like that. One that bites and devours one another as opposed to serving one another in love. The same way and the same commitment and the same sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Why would I not be willing to allow that to be poured out to others. Let us pray. God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, your love, your kindness. There's none like you in all the earth, God. And Father, we just pray right now, God, that uh, as, as, as we continue to, to navigate our road and our relationship with you, God, that you would help us to not use our freedom as a means to live any kind of way, but to use our freedom to serve others in love, God. Father, help us to be uh, students of your word, God, and, and help us to be able to discern truth from error.